something we do every day, kind of useful. Just to be different. So you hear all these nice scriptural talks, and now we're going to talk about something called breathing. I said, I, I, um, I had a strange career. Um, when the bio, you know the bionic ear? I think this is inside your lug hole. Yeah. Um, the bit that actually goes inside the cochlea is my bit. They, they couldn't get it to work. The body would eat through platinum in two days. Now, platinum is an inert metal, etc. You can, you can stick it out and it'll, it'll last for a long, long time. Put it in the body, two days later, gone. And so we did this work with the otolaryngology, the INA hospital, um, and it intrigued me that the body could do this. It produces this protein, which if the surgeon scratches the platinum even slightly, the body says, I don't like this, and it brings out this, this protein, and the protein produces something which is a stronger acid than we can produce. It's better than hydrofluoric acid. And it goes straight through, and it's through. And if you don't scratch it, it's all right. So what we had to do was stop the, the um, doctors doing what doctors do, which is straighten things and use their teeth, um, and get an insertion tool. You think surgeons are amazing. I was sitting there, and this, this brain surgeon, I'm talking to him, and he said, why does the body take out the energy out of a drill? I said, pardon, I'm a metallurgist. It doesn't do that. He said, yes, it does. He said, the first time you do, you drill a hole through the skull, and it goes, mm. The second time it's, the third time it's, and then the fourth time it's, I said, have you ever heard of sharpening drills? He said, no. And there's this guy, you know, oh, surgeons. Right, an inter- if anybody here is a surgeon, I'm deeply sorry. That's the way that is, I think sometimes. And these guys, we had to get the insertion tool, as I said, so that when they put it in, they didn't bend it. Because, you know, they looked and say, oh, it's bent, and they put their thumbnail again, and it's going, brrr, and all these little platinum rings on there go, bing, disappear. <sighs> okay, really, just to be different. Um, a, a talk of insanity. But I've spoken about, in Melbourne, I've spoken about the heart, the eyes, the liver, the blood, the nose, etc., etc. And this time I'm putting it, I, I put it all together to talk about breathing. So you've got all this junk so sitting in there. I'm a poor, humble metallurgist. So the air comes down there, goes oodle oodle, and comes back out again. That's the scientific term, oodle oodle. Okay, so you breathe 15 to 25 times every minute, 30,000 times a day, 10 million times a year. And if you are slightly aged at 70, you, you breathe you breathe in 700 million times. Now, if you do stuff, you pick something up, you get tired arms. Your lungs just keep going. Who <laughs> worries about that? After I've given this talk, so many people came up to me and said, I was lying in bed at night thinking, keep breathing. <laughs> keep breathing. <laughs> Now, you get this scientific gobbledygook. As you breathe air in through your nose or mouth, it goes past the epiglottis and into the trachea. I call it the trachea, and I was told it was trachea. It continues down the trachea, through your vocal cords, the larynx, until it reaches the bronchi, and the bronchi air passes into each lung. The air then follows narrow and narrow bronchioles until it reaches the alveoli. You sit there and think, I've got a clue what that means. I'm a poor hundred metallurgist. So we'll go through it a bit more. Air comes from outside where it is dry, dusty, germ-infested, and usually, well, not here, cold. When you scratch yourself, you're really worried about bugs getting in, and yet when you breathe in, you bring in all these bugs. I suppose that's meat. I don't know. So, you tend to remove it. It is phenomenal. Firstly, that certain parts of your anatomy are just the right size for cleaning that stuff out. I don't know why this gets a reaction. <laughs> Together with mucus secreted from your cells, it's not. Together with cells secreted from your cells lining the airway, cilia trap the particles, that's the hair bit, helping prevent respiratory infection. So you've got these stuff, and you've got this stuff that your nose produces, and it traps bacteria. Viruses and bacteria are also attacked by enzymes, call that thing, in the mucous cells. 
Microbes that slip through are usually handled by white blood cells called phagocytes, or whatever they're called, that envelop and eat these invaders in the lungs. So you breathe in all this junk, and you, you, while you are breathing in, all clean. Isn't that amazing? It removes all the dust and dirt and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely astounding. Um, there's a little um, um, article on the nose, and in it it says, what an amazing piece of engineering design it is. Whoever designed it was a brilliant engineer. We know the engineer. And these are mucus cells. They look like mucus cells. Okay? Oh wait, there's more. As the air passes into your airways, it becomes warmer and more humid. If it didn't, your lungs would crack up. There's not enough moisture in there. By the time the air reaches your lungs, it is at the ideal temperature and humidity. Now, if you go up in a plane where there's lower amounts of, of oxygen, your, blood, your, 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 um, your lungs do all sorts of stuff to make sure it's just the right temperature, just the right pressure, just the right everything. By the, by the time your air reaches your lungs, it is the idle temperature and humidity. When you exhale, your nose conserves water by recovering about a third of the moisture present in each exhale breath. Now, when you breathe in and you want to get moisture into something, what does that mean your nose is? Wet, right? Say yes. Oh, good. So your nose is wet as you are breathing in to make the air wetter. Then when you breathe out, in order to get the moisture out, your nose must be dry. How's it do that? You're breathing in, super wet. Breathe out, it's acting like a dry thing. You see, it's really good if you've got two noses. It's not a problem. That moisture is then used to assist the humidification of the next breath. What a brilliant design. Nice and simple. Air comes in from outside, which usually when the air is dry, dusty, germ infested and usually cold. As it passes through the nose, it is cleaned of the dust, most of the germs are removed, it's heated and it's made humid. Because otherwise your lungs would crack up. You also can't get the oxygen out of the, uh, out of the air unless it is that way. What controls breathing? Well, you've got a brain there, which most people have got. And this is in fact, as far as breathing is concerned, is totally useless. The, I, I was told it was medulla, I thought it was a medulla, but it's medulla, controls your breathing, not your main brain. That's why you're breathing right now and not thinking, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. It's not like you fall asleep and go, <coughs> and croak. So it's that little thing, that little bit of primitive stuff at the base of your brain, just on the brain stem, the medulla, is the bit that controls everything, so it's got nothing to do with your brain. The nerve cells that live within these sensors automatically send signals to the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles to contract and relax at regular intervals. And there's your diaphragm there, looks a bit like a parachute, it's underneath there, and it goes choop choop, and as it goes down, it produces a vacuum inside here, air gets sucked in, as it relaxes, air gets blown out. So there it is, the medulla controls all this without you thinking. In fact, if you do think, you get breathless, don't you? Do you ever do that? I sit there and think, I'm going to control my breathing. <laughs> oh, good. Wait, there's more. Oxygen, specialised nerve cells within the aorta and the carotid arteries called peripheral chemoreceptors monitor the oxygen concentration of the blood and feed back to the respiratory centre. If the oxygen concentration in the blood decreases, they tell the respiratory centre to increase the rate and depth of breathing. Now, the aorta is a little pipe on top of your heart that goes like that. And now we thought it was just a pipe. But sitting inside that pipe is a little sensor that senses the amount of oxygen in the blood. Now, for us to sense the amount of oxygen in the blood takes a fairly big piece of equipment. This thing does it without any problems. Good. Come on. So now we have the aorta actually measures the oxygen somehow, feeds back to the medulla, to make your diaphragm contract more often. So this pipe has got a, um, we, we, in, in scientific terms, it's got a quadrupole mass spectrometer sitting inside it, 